Well, it is indeed an honor to be with you, especially on today, an amazing thing to be here in Washington, D.C. to uh, consider 500 years, half a millennium. And I hope that you will look at this not as the end of uh, Reformation celebration, but just the beginning. Because in reality, as you think about it, uh, next year we can talk about the, uh, the Heidelberg Disputation in April, and then the next year the, uh, the Leipzig Disputation, and uh, we've got the Diet of Worms coming up, and there's, this is just the beginning uh, of hopefully an opportunity to seriously think about what took place in the past, and to recognize that while we can very much celebrate what God did in that, the, uh, the presentation of the gospel, the clarity of the gospel that was presented therein, that we were dealing with human beings who lived in a particular time and they were influenced by the world in which they lived. I love teaching church history because church history is one of the few times when we can have a mirror in which we can finally see ourselves. So often we're so, we're so tied up in the disputes and the arguments and the debates of our age, that we do not have a perspective to be able to see ourselves in a meaningful fashion. Church history gives us that opportunity because God's been working with his people for a very, very long time. And therefore we can look back and we can see what he has done in their lives and recognize that, you know what, he's doing the same thing amongst us. And we can learn from their successes, we can be uh, excited to stand with Luther at Worms, and, and we can, uh, whether he said it or not, it sounds Lutheran anyways. Here stehe ich, ich kann nicht anders Gott helfe mir. Here I stand, I can do no other, God help me. And we can be excited about that, and, and there's every reason to be excited about a man who was willing, uh, in the light of the threat upon his life, when Luther, and I'm assuming that most of you uh, heard Dr. Lawson's talk this morning, when Luther uh, went into Worms, uh, as he came around one of the corners, uh, up, up on the wall, someone had scrawled, Luther the Saxon Hus. And if you know who Jan Hus was, he was the Bohemian uh, preacher and minister who uh, only a little over 100 years earlier had been given safe conduct, just as Luther had been given safe conduct by the emperor, uh, to go uh, to the Council of Constance to answer for his teaching. But over time, his supporters had to leave. He was eventually arrested. He was put through a farcical trial, uh, and he was condemned to death in the flames at the Council of Constance, the same council that healed the schism of the papacy. There were as many as three popes at the time of the Council of Constance, and they, they healed that, but that was the same council that burned Jan Hus. So here's Luther coming into Worms, and someone's put up on the wall, Luther, the Saxon Hus. This was a statement that in all likelihood he was going to die, and he expected actually uh, to die for standing for his faith there at Worms. And, and historically we know that when he was asked if he would recant, he asked for 24 hours to consider the situation. He wasn't given an opportunity to debate. And he was seriously thinking, could I be wrong? Uh, could, everybody was saying, Luther, how can you be right and everybody else is wrong and the centuries of church tradition and everything else? And, and yet finally, when faced with the choice, what does he say? I, I cannot follow popes and councils. They have contradicted themselves. You cannot go against conscience unless I am shown from the word of God by evident reason that I'm in error, then I, I must stand here, and he does. And, and of course, we know he dies of old age many years later, actually. Uh, it's, it's amazing, God's providence in keeping him alive. But yes, we can celebrate that. We can look at our situation today and go, how many people would do what Luther did? How many of us would do what Luther did? We can celebrate that, and we can celebrate the reality of, of a man who, who came to understand through the study of the Scriptures, through the availability of the original languages of the Scriptures. For the first time, the printed edition of the Greek New Testament with the, the, the Greek and the Latin side by side from Erasmus, first published in 1516. Here, the, the light begins to dawn, and, and Luther is comparing the Latin and the Greek, and, and the Latin says, "Penitentium agate, do penance. But over at the Greek, it says metanoiate, repent. And, and we're looking through the sources and, you know, repentance is not doing penance. That's, that's not the same thing. And, and so he begins to come to understand this great gift. And he has feared the righteousness of God. 
because that demanded of him something he knew he could not have. He had fasted and he had prayed and he had confessed and, and he had done all the things he could do. And, and, and just a few weeks ago with Mike there in Germany, I, I, I looked into the last cell that he inhabited at the Augustinian Monastery in Erfurt. And, and he would lay on that, that, that stone floor in the cold of the German winter. Uh, without a bed, without a blanket, trying to, uh, to, to subdue the desires of his body. As he himself said, if anyone would ever be saved by monkery, it would have been me. But it did not give him peace. And so over time, he comes to understand what true peace with God is, that, that righteousness of God that he had feared, that he had hated. When he heard the phrase, the righteousness of God, he would, it would boil up in him. That, that's not fair. We can't accomplish the righteousness of God. We can't do that in our lives. That condemns us until he comes to understand that the righteousness of God is something given to us by faith. It's not something that we can add to. It's not something that we can earn. All the sacraments in the world could not bring you that peace with God. He comes to understand that. And that's what gives him the strength to stand before Charles V. And that's what gives him uh, the strength to, to do what he did when he was in the Wartburg Castle. And he translates the New Testament into German. And he's, he's fighting against all these different struggles that were his, including some fairly serious physical struggles. And so can we honor Martin Luther today? Of course we can. Even though I recognize that he never would have extended to me the right hand of fellowship. In fact, uh, and this is going to be my focus today, depending on what time in Martin Luther's life we're talking about, uh, minimally uh, in his later life, he would have had me banished and quite probably imprisoned. And when I think of all the reformers, that's the case with every single one of them. That's the case with every single one of them. Ulrich Zwingli, I have walked across the bridge in Zurich where beginning only a few years after the Reformation there in Zurich, Anabaptists, and Anabaptist is a term that unfortunately is used of a wide, wide, wide variety of perspectives and beliefs. But Anabaptists were given their third baptism from that bridge. And of course, their first baptism would be infant baptism, their second baptism, adult baptism upon profession of faith, their third baptism, execution by drowning. And this wasn't being done by Roman Catholics. Rome had been burning them as heretics for many centuries. But now the Protestants were doing the same thing, maybe a little bit different way of execution, but still uh, execution. And Calvin, a second generation reformer years later, would likewise have minimally requested my banishment from the realms around Geneva. And so I can be excited about Luther's life. I can be excited about what God did in Zwingli's life. I can, I can be tremendously blessed by reading the Institutes, the Christian religion. And yet these are individuals who never in this life would have extended to me the right hand of fellowship and might have even sought the end of my life. For many people, that's just too big, a, too big a gap to reach across. How could Christians have treated other Christians in that way? And this is where today we must recognize that we cannot, we dare not, judge the people who came before us by the standards that we have today. We must judge them on the basis of when they lived, what they knew. It's because... The reality is, if the Lord tarries and generations beyond us look back upon us, you're going to wish that they would have been judged, that they would judge you, I'm sorry, by the standards that you have today, not by theirs somewhere down the road. That's not fair. You want to be judged fairly, and the same way we must judge others fairly as well. And so, when we look at Luther, we think of a man who is hiding out from the empire in the Wartburg Castle in 1521-1522. He is taking the name of Junker Jorg, Knight George. Not much of a knight. Uh, Luther was not the outdoorsy type, I can assure you. And 
he's seeking the freedom to speak God's truth. And even while he's there, the Reformation is going on in Wittenberg. And it starts to accelerate, and it starts to get a little bit violent. Under our, uh, Andreas Karlstadt, they're destroying, uh, they're destroying statues. Karlstadt announces that on New Year's Eve, he's going to, uh, 1521, he's going to give the Mass in both the bread and the wine to all the people, because the wine had been withdrawn from the people during the medieval period once the doctrine of transubstantiation became popular. And he announces he's going to invite everyone to partake of the full supper. And so Duke Frederick goes, um, no, you're not. And so as the dutiful, obedient servant of the elector, uh, Karl Stott goes, okay, I won't. I'll do it on Christmas Eve instead. And so uh, that's what they did. And on Christmas Eve, you have the people rushing into the castle church, and, and they are so excited to partake of the supper. And the, the, the Reformation is going very, very quickly, and it seems to be out of control. And, and Luther even takes a flying return back to Wittenberg to sort of check things out, and then back to the Wartburg Castle. And, and then right around the same time, the Zwickau prophets come into Wittenberg. And the Zwickau prophets, you know, they, they, they think if all you have is the Bible, you don't have nearly enough. God speaks directly to them. They have direct personal revelation. And, and what's fascinating is, initially, Luther's response is, well, we, we, we need to hear them out. I don't want any, any force to be used against them. We, we need to hear out what they have to say. And so in that time period between the beginning of the Reformation, 1517, and for the next number of years, we find in Luther someone who recognizes he himself is having to strive for some level of acceptance and religious freedom. And this can be seen, for example, in his words toward the Jews. Now, we need to understand, I don't have time today to even begin to go through the very, very sordid story of the history of what calls itself the Christian church and the Jews. The division between church and synagogue went back a long, long ways. And it's an ugly history, a very ugly history. Again, we, we can go back to the fourth century. We can find John Chrysostom, and we can, we can find in Chrysostom some incredibly beautiful sermons. He was called John the Golden Mouthed. That's what that means. And, and, and you can read his words, and so often we're like, oh, that's, that's incredible. He was really, really good. Except for the fact that we can also find in him some horrific words directed toward the Jewish people. The history of Rome and Roman Catholicism and the papacy uh, toward the Jews was not a positive thing whatsoever. And so it's interesting to read from Martin Luther. These words, these were penned in 1523 in a little tract that he wrote called Jesus Was Born a Jew. And listen to what Luther says. Therefore, I will cite from Scripture the reasons that move me to believe that Christ was a Jew born of a virgin, that I might perhaps also win some Jews to the Christian faith. Our fools, the popes, so, bishops, sophists, and monks. I'm going to read what he said. Please forgive me. The crude asses' heads have hitherto so treated the Jews that anyone who wished to be a good Christian would almost have to become a Jew. If I had been a Jew and had seen such dolts and blockheads govern and teach the Christian faith, I would sooner have been a hog than a Christian. They have dealt with the Jews as if they were dogs rather than human beings. They have done little else than deride them and seize their property. When they baptize them, they show nothing of Christian doctrine or life, but only subject them to popishness and monkery. When the Jews then see that Judaism has such a strong support in Scripture and that Christianity has become a mere babble without reliance on Scripture, how can they possibly compose themselves and become right good Christians? I have myself heard from pious baptized Jews that if they had not in our day heard the gospel, they would have remained Jews under the cloak of Christianity for the rest of their days. For they acknowledge that they have never yet heard anything about Christ from those who baptized and taught them. I hope that if one deals in a kindly way with the Jews and instructs them carefully from Holy Scripture, many of them will become genuine Christians and turn again to the faith of their fathers, the prophets and patriarchs. They will only be frightened further away from it 
if their Judaism is so utterly rejected that nothing is allowed to remain, and they are treated only with arrogance and scorn. If the apostles, who also were Jews, had dealt with us Gentiles as we Gentiles deal with the Jews, there would never have been a Christian among the Gentiles. Since they dealt with us Gentiles in such brotherly fashion, we in our turn ought to treat the Jews in a brotherly manner in order that we might convert some of them. For even we ourselves are not yet all very far along, not to speak of having arrived. So here in 1523, that, if you, if you know medieval church history, is an incredibly open-minded, liberal approach to the Jewish people, 1523. This is only a year after Luther himself is in hiding in the Wartburg Castle. But then if we move farther on in Luther's life, we find what seems to be a genuine contradiction to this attitude. Yes, when the Zwickau prophets first came, I don't want any force used against them. We need to, we need to try to win the, the Jews with kindness, careful scriptural exposition. We need to show Christ to them. But sadly, if you've done any reading, you know it doesn't stay that way. It doesn't stay that way. It is not long before in Lutheran lands, the 1530s, if you were to take the perspective of an Anabaptist, the Zwickau prophets, you would be arrested. You would be either forced out of Lutheran territory or imprisoned or even executed. Luther dies in 1546, so he is well aware of all these things. He has, he has agreed to these things. He, he recognizes what's going on. He does not stop these things. He supports it. And so, just a few weeks ago, when we were in Germany, uh, I asked the sovereign staff to help me visit something. We were going to the Wartburg Castle, and so I, I said, I want to... I want to visit the cell of Fritz Erba. And uh, I think uh, Mike and Kathy will confirm. They looked at me and, and went, what? What strange thing do you want to do now? And so they called ahead, and Kathy and I went ahead to the castle before the main group got there. And they said that, well, uh, there's a, you know, it's 50 cents to, to go up the South Tower. And, and uh, so we paid our 50 cents and started up the South Tower. And the first thing you come to, is this little cell. And you walk into it, we, you can get about 14, 15 people into this tiny little room if you cram them all in. And in the middle of the floor is a hole. Now it's of course graded up. And they have a light down in the cell itself so you can see how far down it is. Basically, it's just you are in a tower and it's the inside of the tower going all the way down to its foundations. It's about 30 feet down from where you are. And that hole you're standing around is called the terror hole. Because you can imagine if you were being imprisoned and there isn't a light down there, it's just a huge, black, cold hole. No windows, no doors. This is the only way in or out. And the only way in there is you're tied up and you're lowered by a rope. That would be terrifying for me. I think it would be terrifying for anyone. And as I look down that hole, Kathy and I started talking. We walked the rest of the way up to the top of the tower, and I looked out across the, the grounds of the Wartburg Castle toward where Luther's room was, where he translated the New Testament into German. And I was struck deeply by the contrast presented by a recognition of the history of that place. Everybody walking through there was looking at Luther's room and, you know, the, ink, the inkwell throwing incident and, and all the rest of that kind of stuff and translating. It's only 10 weeks. It was amazing. It was a monument of scholarship that, that, uh, that Luther had done such a tremendous job. And that's pretty much everyone's seeing as they go through there. Almost nobody. We'd, I was watching people just go sort of look in, just walk on by Fritz Erba's cell 
But you see, what I realized was, in this situation, what you've got is you've got, you've got Luther translating the New Testament in 1522. It's published a little bit later. And then only a few years later, because it's 1533 when Fritz Erba is arrested down in Eisenach. He's arrested for having read Luther's New Testament and believing it. Because he believed it, he refused to have his children baptized. And so he was arrested. And initially, he was imprisoned down in Eisenach, but there was a window to his cell. And so he was preaching out his window, and he was converting people. And so it was decided that was too dangerous, and so they took him up to the Wartburg Castle. And in 1541, he was lowered down through that terror hole into that hole in the ground. I don't know about you, but I can't imagine what it would be like to be down there, even for a few moments, especially when there was no light. But that's where Fritz Erba was, and they would lower food down to him, of course. And Lutheran preachers would come, and they would, they would preach down to him from, from up above, trying to convert him from the error of his ways. But he would not repent of the error of his ways. Luther knew he was there. Luther's alive at this time. He does not do anything about Fritz Erba. He does not intercede for Fritz Erba. Even though it's at the exact same place where he had hidden out from the empire himself, he knows that there is a man imprisoned there, well, we would say for issues of conscience. But he does nothing. And he is in that hole from 1541 until he dies seven years later. Seven years in that hole. They believe they found his body in archaeological digs in 2006 outside the walls of the castle church, of the castle there in, uh, at Barberg. This was happening all across Protestant Europe. Many of the Anabaptists, the reason they can never really develop a systematic theology is you'd only live a few years if you were an Anabaptist leader before you would either be imprisoned or executed, whether you were in Roman Catholic lands or Protestant lands. It didn't matter which. And you will read material about Luther, and there will be many people who will point out that the Nazis used quotes from Martin Luther as part of their propaganda for their final solution. Now, it is obviously grossly unfair to blame Martin Luther for the use of his words long after his life, but it is also quite true that you could use his words. Because in 1543, so Luther dies in 1546, so 20 years after the words I read to you earlier, remember they were 1523, remember I gave you that date? 20 years later, he writes a book, and it is titled The Jews and Their Lies. And here is what, this is just a portion of what he wrote. What shall we Christians do with this rejected and condemned people, the Jews? Since they live among us, we dare not tolerate their conduct now that we are aware of their lying and reviling and blaspheming. If we do, we become sharers in their lies, cursing and blasphemy. Thus, we cannot extinguish the unquenchable fire of divine wrath of which the prophets speak, nor can we convert the Jews. With prayer and the fear of God, we must practice a sharp mercy to see whether we might save at least a few from the glowing flames. We dare not avenge ourselves. Vengeance a thousand times worse than we could wish them already has them by the throat. I shall give you my sincere advice. First, to set fire to their synagogues or schools and to bury and cover with dirt whatever will not burn so that no man will ever again see a stone or cinder of them. This is to be done in honor of our Lord and of Christendom. Keep that in mind. So that God might see that we are Christians and do not condone or knowingly tolerate such public lying, cursing, and blaspheming of his son and of his Christians.' 
For whatever we tolerated in the past unknowingly, and I myself was unaware of it, will be pardoned by God. But if we, now that we are informed, were to protect and shield such a house for the Jews existing right before our very nose, in which they lie about, blaspheme, curse, vilify, and defame Christ and us, it would be the same as if we were doing all this and even worse ourselves, and we, as we very well know. Now, we hear these words and we're shocked. And we ask, what happened? 20 years. Huge difference between these two quotations. I want to suggest to you the title of my talk, The Two Luthers. There aren't two Luthers. There's only one Luther. But there was a major event in Luther's life that formalized, solidified, and crystallized a certain concept in Luther's thinking that totally changed his attitude. Because anyone who reads the Luther of the early period finds a sensitivity and a warmth that is very, very attractive to us. But unfortunately, if you read many of his sermons later in life, much of that warmth is not there. And in fact, if you go to Eisleben, where he both was born but didn't really live there, and died but didn't really live there, if you look at the last sermons that he preached after already had, having suffered heart attack, before he suffered a series of others that took his life there in Eisleben, you will find that in those very last sermons, the very same sentiments as I just read, and even worse, were expressed by Luther in those sermons, exhorting the Christian leaders to banish the Jews from their lands. What happened? I believe that the turning point was the Peasants' Revolt of 1525. In 1525, the leaders of the nations had been mishandling and mistreating the people of the land. They had been taxing them. They would not allow them to get out of the feudal system. And at first, Luther was very supportive of the complaints that the peasants had. Very supportive. And so when the revolt began, the peasants looked to Martin Luther to Bootser and Strasbourg, to Ulrich Zwingli. Since they were leading the reform, the peasants looked to them. They will listen to us. And at first, Luther was very sympathetic until one thing happened. When the peasants began sacking castles, burning their victims, engaging in acts of violence, One of Luther's greatest fears was that he had been accused of unleashing upon the world forces that would result in absolute anarchy. And he took very serious that accusation. He was extremely concerned because the Turks, Muslims, were at the gates of Vienna. There was a great danger. They were going to sweep across Europe and wipe out all of Christendom, and for a thousand years, as far back as anyone can remember, the church and the state had been one. They had been connected. It had been an ugly relationship, but that was all that Luther knew. And when the peasant revolt took place, he was faced with a choice. He had recognized in his earlier years that a free church, a church that you freely associated with, would be the only church that could have personal holiness. It would be the only church where you'd have a regenerate membership. But when that revolt takes place, at some point in time, he makes the decision, the Reformation absolutely requires that it be 
magisterial. It'd be a reformation of the governmental church, the state church. This is called sacralism, the relationship of the church and the state. And so he tells the rulers, if the peasants become violent, then slay them. And they did. To the tune of a hundred thousand peasants. And to this day, if you go to Germany and travel from the north to the south, you can literally see a line where north of a certain line, the churches are Lutheran. South of a certain line, they're Catholic. He lost all of southern Germany in the Peasants' Revolt. I truly believe that in that time, Luther's thinking became solidified on the absolute necessity of magisterial reformation. The princes must be on board. This must be a reformation of the state church. And therefore, when you take it from that perspective, he was perfectly in line with everything that had come before him. Luther was not the first one to say these types of things about the Jews. What you need to remember is that the Roman Catholic Church in the centuries before, for example, there had been a publication called Malleus Maleficorum, The Hammer Against Witches. It was a manual for searching out witches, and it was produced with papal authority, and it was an amazingly wild and strange document that led to the burnings of many innocent people. Astrology was rampant. During the Black Death, Christians had taken Jews and accused them of being the source of the Black Death. One, one city in Switzerland had taken all their Jews, put them in a house on an island in the lake, and burned the house down as an attempt to try to stop the Black Death. It's fascinating. Historically, it's a simple reality that in Christian lands, Jews were blamed for the Black Death. The Black Death had gone through Muslim lands, and they never blamed the Jews. Things have changed. Things have changed. But you see, even Martin Bootser, before Luther wrote his book, Martin Bootser, who is very well known as a kind-hearted, almost ecumenical type spirit, had proposed many of the same solutions in regards to the Jews that Luther did. And Luther's lifelong enemy, Johann Eck, three years before Luther's book came out, had written a much longer book attacking the Jews in, with much more ferocity. It was the worst book produced in that period. And so here you have Luther's enemy, who had warned about Luther from as early as 1518, who had debated him at Leipzig, who was behind trying to get the condemnation. He is Luther's enemy, and yet within a few years, he and Luther are both putting out books that give credence to the wildest and most insane accusations against the Jews, accusations that continue to this day, sadly, in places like Palestine that the Jews kill Christian children and drink their blood and make matzah out of the blood of children and all the rest of this kind. That was going on back then, and they all gave credence to it, Roman Catholic and Protestant. Why? Again, from their perspective, the idea of freedom of religion and the idea of multiple religious groups existing in one area was absolutely scandalous. It was scandalous. Hadn't happened for a thousand years. That explains Fritz Erba as well. Because you see, you and I, we listen to the story of Fritz Erba and we, we cannot help but translate that story to our modern age. And we're like, Wait a minute, it's a, it's a theological argument. I've debated my Presbyterian brothers a number of times on the subject of baptism. And I wasn't thrown into a 30-foot hole as a result. <laughs> and I didn't seek to have them thrown into a 30-foot hole as a result. Because we're in a different age, a different time. We may take it very, very seriously. 
The Westminster Confession of Faith identifies it as sin to not baptize your children. Okay, it's a serious issue, but everyone that I've debated called me a brother in Christ, did not seek my harm, did not seek to silence me, did not seek to have me in prison. What's changed? Well, sacralism, state church. You see, from Luther's perspective, Fritz Erba is not just theologically confused. He is a criminal against the state. His heresy strikes the very foundation of Christendom. Remember I, I emphasized that phrase, Christendom, in Luther's words? It strikes the very foundation. You can't have a Christendom if you have multiple churches. Christendom is one. So at the Peace of Augsburg in 1530, it was agreed, whichever land you live in, if your king is a, is a Lutheran or a Catholic, that's what you have to be. So your king determines it. And keep in mind also, the baptism rolls of the church were the basis of the tax rolls of the state. So if you don't baptize your children, what are you doing? You are diminishing the very tax basis of being able to raise armies to fight the Turks. And so the argument is these people who don't baptize their children are helping us to lose the war against the Turks who will then come in and kill all of us. They are a danger. They will destroy society. Luther feared that with the peasants, and he recognized the necessity in a sacral system that someone like Fritz Erba be kept out of society, locked in a dungeon in the South Tower of the Wartburg Castle in the dark over a theological issue. It wasn't just a theological issue. The Jews, stories were circulated that they were causing Christians to convert. Well, in 1523, Luther understood why that was. By 1543, that was no longer a consideration. And so, if the stories were true, and so many of these stories, of course, unfortunately, had been coerced out of people under torture, but if the stories were true about the cursing of the Christians in the synagogues and the conversions at night of Christians to Judaism and the blood libel and all the horrific things that were, that were ascribed to them, well, you can't have this in a Christian society. In a Christian society, you must defend Christendom. And so if these people are doing these things, they must be driven out. They can't be allowed to do this. God will consider us to be as guilty as they are if we turn a blind eye to these things. And so the only reason that Luther's, and it's not anti-Semitism, it was anti-Judaism. There's a difference. It wasn't a racial thing for Luther. He didn't care about the race. He cared about the religion. He cared about the danger that that presented to the Christian people. Now, when you look at these words from Luther, the only reason that they are so much better known today, and if you go on the net today, you'll find, a, I bet you see a bunch of articles dated today because it's October 31st, 2017, reminding us I saw one on, I believe it was the Gospel Coalition website just earlier this week. We can celebrate the Reformation, but we can't celebrate Luther because of Luther's Jewish problem. I haven't seen anybody talking about Butzer's Jewish problem or Zwingli's Jewish problem or Johann Eck's Jewish problem. They were just as bad as Luther. Luther didn't come up with anything new. If, if in anything, believe it or not, that was moderated in comparison to Eck. The reason he's remembered is A, his prominence in the Reformation, and B, the reality, and it is a reality, that he was the German reformer. 
And therefore, when his words appeared in the pamphlets and the teachings of the Nazis starting in the mid-1930s in regards to the final solution, that wasn't, that wasn't Luther's intention, but that's what they used him as. And since of the, he had that standing of importance and having a stat, translated the German Bible, German language, a hero of the, of the fatherland, then his words are remembered. Johann X are forgotten, Boots are the rest, they're forgotten. But all the reformers were sacredless. All the for, reformers were looking for a magisterial reformation. And even when you go to the second generation and you talk about Calvin, you immediately hear the word, the name, Servetus. Why? Magisterial Reformation, sacralism. Constantinianism, going back to the fact that really when you look back through history, when did all this start? Well, never ever look at history in the way that so many books present it, where you have just these lists of dates. Well, purgatory develops here, and this develops here. No, it's always a, a complex web of development over time. And when Constantine calls the Council of Nicaea in 325, is that a major step toward what we will eventually... Was that a step toward Fritz Erba's cell? Yeah, it was. There were a lot of people even that day that were like, wow, 13 years ago, the Roman Empire was killing us. For 50 or 60 years, the, the, the strongest period of imperial persecution of Christianity had been from the middle of that century up until 313. It's only been 13 years, and now the emperor is paying for us to get together at Nicaea, and he's attending the council? There were a lot of people that were just a little bit uncomfortable with that. It's understandable. But could anyone at that time have seen what would eventually come about? I don't think so. Not even 100 years later, in North Africa, Augustine. And everybody loves Augustine. I mean, both... Sides in Reformation were constantly quoting from Augustine. They wanted Augustine on their side. And both sides could do so. They could do so honestly. Because it, Augustine had contradicted himself. Well, why? Well, the first big controversy of Augustine's life was called the Donatist controversy. There had been a schism in the church long before he came along due to persecution. And certain people had moved away from what would be called the small C Catholic church they started their own church. They considered themselves to be the pure Christians. They whitewashed all of their churches in, in bright white. And at one point in Augustine's life, when they had a conclave of bishops, there were 700 Donatist bishops from North Africa. That's a lot of people. A lot of people. And he had to deal with this division, and that's where he developed his ecclesiology, his doctrine of the church, and of the sacraments. That sacramental theology would become Rome's sacramental theology throughout the Middle Ages. And that's why Roman Catholics can adequately quote Augustine in their defense in regards to the nature of the church and sacramentology. But the next great controversy in his life was the Pelagian controversy, and that's where you have Augustine talking about grace and predestination election and all the stuff that the Protestants quote him on. And as B.B. Warfield, I think, very rightly said, the Protestant Reformation inwardly considered was nothing more than the victory of Augustine's doctrine of grace over Augustine's doctrine of the church. And it's true. Now, when Augustine was finally talked into the utilization of imperial troops to help suppress the Donatists, at first, he resisted it, but finally he was talked into it. And the basis he used for it from Scripture was Jesus' parable, compel them to come in. Remember the marriage feast? Compel them to come in. That's ah, stretching it just a little bit. 
Now, could Augustine have seen that his was a next major step in Constantinianism, sacralism, magisterialism, the state church, all the intertwining and everything that's going to result from that? Could he have seen that? I don't think so. But it was the next step. And so you have this development over time until you have Fritz Erba in his cell. You have men and women tied up with their arms behind their back, being lowered by Christian ministers from a bridge in Zurich into the icy waters until they're dead of drowning. And they do it as a mockery, their third baptism. I think it surprised many of the people in our group that what well, we did, and I'm very, very thankful that we had the opportunity of doing this, once I talked with Kathy about what happened with Fritz Erba and just the contrast that I felt of Luther over here, Erba here, and this one place, and she said, you know, would you, would you like to bring our group up here? And so they sprung into action, and, and after uh, they toured the castle, uh, Kathy and Janica went and got uh, 50 cent pieces well, they're euros, 50, whatever they call them in, in euros, but, uh, and had a bag of them, and, and we had to split our group in two because you can only put about 14, 15 people in this room, and we sent the group up, and uh, Mike came up with probably the same camera he's got back there right now and, and set it up, and uh, I did a little five, six-minute thing in this little teeny tiny cramped room about Fritz Erba. And just looking at faces... People are like, really? You just ruined the whole thing for me. And here we are talking about it on Reformation Day, and some of you might be sitting there going, thanks loads, White. We appreciate it. I was going to dress up as Martin Luther tonight, but now I'm really not feeling, feeling the vibes anymore, you know? I understand. I get it. One of the older ladies in our, in our group came up to me that night, and she's like, I can't believe that Christians can do that to other Christians. I, 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 and I'm like, be careful, be careful. You, you, you go far enough there and you're, there aren't any Christians in the past because unfortunately, this is our history. This is our history. And by the end of the, end of the tour, she came up to me and said, okay, I get it now, but man, that, that really does change everything. You really have to start thinking about yourself, how many blind spots you have. If your heroes in the past had those traditions and blind spots, guess what? You probably do too. And you may not even know it because you're so close. You don't have the perspective to be able to see it. But as we stood in that little room, I finished my, my talk by saying, now, you know, folks, what we have to remember, if we believe what we believe, that there is a day coming when God's going to make all things new, justice is going to be done, the thoughts and intents of the hearts are going to be laid bare, and those who are in Christ Jesus will find themselves vindicated, not because of anything they've done, but because of the perfect work of their Savior in their behalf, and all of our ignorances and traditions taken out of the way. There will come a day only because of the work of Jesus Christ. That Fritz Erba will embrace those who imprisoned him as brothers and sisters in Christ, and they will have a relationship in eternity closer than any human relationship here on earth could ever be. But only because of what Christ has done. Even that kind, that deep level of division 
You and I cannot even imagine what it would be like to look up from the inside of that tower to that sliver of light, and down comes your food on a rope in a bucket. That's your only connection with the world and with human beings. Just waiting for that little bit of light to filter down. How many of us would have stood firm for seven years? I will not ever be so presumptuous as to say I could have done that. I would have done that. So we look at that. It's so easy for us Westerners who are very, very individualistic in our thinking to go, I, I will never honor Martin Luther. No, Martin Luther didn't put him down there, but he also didn't do anything about it. He certainly supported it. There were others that you could point to. Even he and Karlstadt ended up having a major split once, once Luther came back to Wittenberg from the Wartburg Castle. He drove Karlstadt out. Karlstadt became an Anabaptist. And even though they met a number of years later, it was an acrimonious meeting. There was no, there was no reconciliation. Will there be someday? Well, I think so. I hope so. I certainly want to believe that that will be the case, that they were both Christians, and yet we look at how they treated one another, and well, the world looks at how they treated one another too. We have to look at history, and we have to recognize that these men lived in a day where the state and the church were one. Today, we don't have that. Now we have a secular state. And people will tell us, it's the Reformation's fault that Europe has become secular. Well, my response to that would simply be this. There's an element of truth to that. But the reality is, the Renaissance had already taken place. There are already forces moving in that direction. And I'm just thankful that what finally broke the stranglehold of Rome's hold on European society was not secularism. It was an actual, deeply biblical proclamation of how a person can be made right before God. And that there have been countless souls, not only in Europe, but around the world because of the missions emphasis that came out of that, that have been ushered into the paradise of God because of the proclamation of that gospel, because of that reformation. Great light broke forth. Post tenebrous looks after the darkness light, yes, but what we see around us today, post looks tenebrous. Because when we sin against great light, God is just to give us darkness. And the great light that gave us such insight into the human soul, into the human nature, into morality and ethics, when we turn our backs upon that, not just turn our backs upon that, but scorn it, repudiate it, and detest it, as you see in Europe and, yes, the United States today, God will not be mocked. It's a wonderful day. 500 years. God's been faithful, but it's not over. And the issues that we face then, we face today. But we as Christians, if we learn anything from history, let us not have a cartoonish view of the Reformation, a cartoonish view of Luther or Calvin or Zwingli or any of the others. Let us recognize God has used imperfect men and women to accomplish his purposes. And let us ask that God would give us perspective to see ourselves, that we might serve him in a way that is illuminated first and foremost by the transcendent gospel. And let us be very wary of becoming caught up in anything that is, it may be the big thing today, 
But 500 years from now, will someone look back at us and go, oh, how blind, how inconsistent were they? We don't want that. We want to be consistent. We want to honor Christ in all things. Thank you very much for your attention.